The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way, because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be to you from God, our Father in heaven, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A friend of mine was in a, a bad car accident this weekend, and she was not seriously injured, thank God. Just some bruises and whiplash, and she carried in her pocket one of those little stones that you might receive at church sometime. A church member gave it to her, and it was a little... Little, little stone, little faith stone. It's had the word faith on it and a cross cut out. She found it in her pocket after the accident cracked by the impact of the seatbelt. Keep Pastor Kim in your prayers. But one of the things that occurred to me yesterday as I heard this news was that the same could happen to me, could happen to any of us at any time. And tragedy is not just something that happens to others. But when we hear of these things happening, we realize our lives are more fragile than we think most of the time. Sure, when I was in my teens and my 20s, I felt like I was invincible. I take more chances, more risks than I'm allowed to these days. Yeah, and I spun a car around a, a curve on a wet road once or twice. In my 30s, I was trying to find my way and had to circle back a few times, change cities, change careers, but ended up meeting some good people, finding a good church, building a family. These days, in my 40s, I'm thinking about what comes next. Time flies, doesn't it? How did I get here? How should I prepare for what comes next? Things are changing so quickly all around us. So I wonder, how will God sustain us in the years to come? Jesus had told his disciples not to worry about anything. You remember the lilies of the field, and the grass withers, and the flowers fade? He's telling them God will provide and care for them no matter what happens. See, he's on his way to Jerusalem. Things are changing fast. He won't be deterred from the mission, though. It's not enough to keep him away. But they lived in a dangerous world, too. Some are telling him about awful things that Pilate has done. And it's no surprise to Jesus, of course. Oh, do you think that they were any different than you? That's going to keep happening. What 
can you do to prevent it, he seems to say. See, some of the people maybe were focused on armed rebellion. They wanted to overthrow these powers that were oppressing them, fighting the powers that be to create a new regime. Jesus is teaching about repentance. Repentance, calling others to follow him, to be about a different kind of life. And he says, unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. And repentance is a, a churchy word. We don't talk like that out in the world. I hope not. Maybe we do sometimes. It's weird. To repent is literally to turn around, to go another way, to change one's mind, to change your way of being in the world. Hmm. Easier said than done, maybe. To turn towards something that gives life rather than the things that are not fulfilling, the things that bring emptiness and misery and death. Most of us struggle with this, and God knows it's not easy. It's more than a one-time deal, too. So to ask or to command people to continue to repent, to continue to turn away from themselves, from their desires, from their selfishness and self-centeredness, is a lot to ask. But that's what Jesus has been doing from the beginning. He's been announcing the kingdom, calling people to turn from the lives they were living to something new. And at every opportunity to give in, to give up, he keeps on going, no matter how frustrating the journey may be. He knows it takes time. So he tells this story of a fig tree. And uh, it, it can be a confusing story, uh, uh, maybe a difficult one to preach on at times, too. But I, I imagine this fig tree planted in a vineyard. Well, that's kind of strange to begin with to us. Maybe we wonder, why would a fig tree be in a vineyard in the first place? Maybe it was there to maximize acreage. You want to plant something in, in the corner. Maybe you can't plant a, a grapevine over there. Maybe it helps the, the, the grapes grow. Not quite sure. Our friends have a fig tree in their yard, and most years it gives so much fruit they have to find uses for it all. They, they're giving away figs all the time. They're making fig jam and fig preserves and fig salads and, I don't know, figgy pudding? Is that a thing? I, it sounds good to me, I guess. Figs grow well in the desert here in Las Vegas. We get that, okay, when the trees are well cared for. But it's been said that it takes a fig tree three years to grow to maturity, and if it hasn't uh, given fruit in that time, well, it's not going to. So it's time for the fig tree to do what it was made to do, and the vineyard owner shows up and finds only leaves, only shade for the grapes, only a trunk sucking up the nutrients from the soil sucking up that precious groundwater. The trees taking up space, giving nothing back in return for the resources it has consumed. So we asked the gardener, WTF, where are the figs? That's what that stands for. Uh, it tells him to cut it down. But the gardener has another idea. Give this tree another year, another chance. Let me see what I can do with the soil. Let me... Uh, do some fertilizing, let me do some, some watering, tend to it a bit more. And what does the gardener believe about this tree? It's just going to change and start giving fruit? It's had an optimal existence. It's been watered and watched for three years, and yet it hasn't produced. What's going to change now? Does he know something the owner doesn't? What can he possibly do to make this stingy tree into something new? I think back to who I was in my teens and 20s. I can see I had it pretty easy. I had a, had a pretty good life. My parents worked hard. I was able to go to school. I had a safe place to sleep, good food to eat. No global pandemics. I had friends to play with. I had just about every advantage. And no, I wasn't very active in church. I spent little time studying scripture. I prayed now and then, but... What was the fruit of my life in those days? Years later, I would see the divorce of my parents, go through one myself, 
experience unemployment, loss, and loneliness before I even began to find out what my life might begin to look like. Sometimes we need to be covered with a little manure in order to find out what it is we were made to do. Gardner's response to the tree that has yet to blossom is the grace of more time, more attention, and more care. This is the way of Jesus, who calls his friends to come and see, and he spends precious time with them, listening, teaching them. As he's going into hostile territory, he's still trying to lead them. He's offering them a new way of life, of faith and of justice. He's giving food and healing people and freedom everywhere he goes. And when the time is right, heading toward the city where his earthly ministry will come to an end and in time will be fulfilled. So some people show up, Pharisees even, and they warn him that Herod is looking to kill him. And Jesus calls Herod a fox, openly insulting this ruler. A fox was sneaky, despised, disloyal. Jesus is not afraid. He's not hiding anymore. He's doing what he was made to do. Jesus is going to Jerusalem where he knows what happens to prophets where he knows he will face his true enemy, where he will find death itself. And the time is urgent. So there's another tree there outside the city walls. And the place it was planted was called the skull. And Jesus has been tempted, been turned away, been threatened with death, and yet cannot be convinced to turn away from the city where he will be crucified. There's an urgency to Jesus' mission, and the work must be finished. See, we don't know how much time we have in our lives, but we hear this call to be about something other than ourselves. So many of us know what it's like to lose someone too early or before we're ready to let them go, but to believe in Jesus, to have faith, to trust in the promises of the kingdom isn't just a punched ticket to heaven. There's still a need and a purpose for each of us here to be who it is we were made to be. We're called to faith that leads us into the world, to love neighbors with a radical grace, to give more than one chance to love each other even when we can't understand the actions of some, to give more than we take, to bless and not to curse, to serve and not count the cost. So we've got work to do as people. We've got work to do as God's children. We've got work to do as the church. And we're moving forward with our mission here to share the heart of Christ in the heart of the city, a city where neighbors are unable to pay rent unable to find good work, unable to get access to medical care or good schools or healthy food. It sounds like a lot. It sounds like we're going to need more time. It sounds like we're going to need more resources and we need each other because we can't do it alone. So we get to partner with Lutheran Social Services of Nevada. We get to partner with Family Promise and we get to partner with Nevadans for the Common Good so that we can serve in every way that we feel called and able. We serve by collecting school supplies for students, needed items for babies and moms, helping to serve seniors here at our senior meal program, and neighbors experiencing homelessness. We don't always get it right, and maybe we don't want to hold that hand and we want to pull away and figure we've got it all figured out on our own, but we're trying to walk the walk to show up for one another, to love each other into producing that big juicy fruit of repentance and faith. Even when we fall flat, Jesus is watering us with grace and mercy, fertilizing us, loving us as we grow in him. Because our faith, though fragile at times, is in the one who knows all the times and ways we have suffered 
who gives us time to feel pain, to be frustrated by our own ways, leads us into times where we get to empty ourselves of what weighs us down and leads us to turn toward that divine love. And even when we have been consumed by the evil of the world and find ourselves unable to bear anything at all, we're loved anyway. Grace is that time to heal, to learn, to be what we were made to be, freed from our own works and our needs for control, our desires for vengeance and wealth and self-righteousness, and welcomed into new life, utterly and completely one with our Savior. Amen.